I'm Leah Duhon, and today we are going to talk about some frequently asked questions in regard to Richard Diaz's Training the Dark Side. Yay! Hear the crowd. Yep. The crowd is going wild. Everybody wants to hear about it. That's <laughs> what we live for. It's what we live for. All right. Um, so I think what we'll kind of start with is I'll just bring up some questions that I've had going to some of your multiple reader clinics, starting to read your book, and then things I've just kind of heard from other people that they seem to be confused on, and I haven't been able to explain <laughs> in a good enough way. So I want to hear your take on it. Um, so the first thing I thought we should broach is something that you talk often about. It's not necessarily about the flow method uh, philosophy, but it's something you're definitely an advocate of, is the 180 beats per minute cadence for running. So um, yeah, let's just hear your kind of explanation for it. And then I kind of want to recap and just wrap my head around it. Okay. Well, for starters, um, the concept of being at 180 strides per minute. So think of it gate frequency. And so one leg comes to the ground, one leg's taking flight, one leg comes to the ground in a cyclical fashion, right? Boom, boom, boom. There's a frequency. And if you were to look at most runners that uh, make mistakes with the way they run, and the biggest mistake about poor mechanics is, is tied to overstriding. Overstriding invokes a breaking force. You're actually having to overcome that collision with the ground before you can get positive response from the contact of the ground. So the slower the frequency indicates the further away from your body you're making contact with the ground. And uh, a traditional heel striker, back in the day, you know, more of them back in the day than today, overstriding to try to get purchase ahead of their body to pull themselves forward pawing the ground to pull themselves forward. There's this moment in contact with the ground where your body's behind your contact. That's why it's called overstriding. And you've hit the ground and you're unstable because you can't stabilize when your foot's ahead of your body that way until your body is over your foot. So the timeline to get to that position where you're, you're basically standing over your foot occurs much more closely to 180 strides than it does 160. Most overstriders are between 160, 170, 175 strides per minute. So at 180, it brings the, the foot closer to contact when you land, which in turn delivers stability much sooner than it would had you been at a slower rate of cadence. So the other consideration is that that slower rate of cadence and that overstriding invokes what's called vertical oscillation. That means that you have to pitch yourself higher into the ground, into the air in order for your foot to come back into the stride frequency, okay? So the higher up you go, being unstable, the harder you land. So now you're starting to talk about injuries, right? So it just so happens that the frequency of 180 strides per minute brings you much closer, much more stable sooner. So you have this uh, this example of the the dots on the earth thing. Could you go into that a little bit? Because remember, when people ask you about this, like, oh, what about different sizes, different shapes of athletes? Oh, yeah. You bring up this example. Okay. And okay, here's the, I'm going to be honest with you. It's never made sense to me. <laughs> I don't understand right. it. But maybe if you went into a little bit more, I can understand that because the, the data thing, that made sense to me um, about just like, hey, it's been tested on all these different athletes and it's pretty much always come back to 180 no matter the size and shape um, of the athlete. So that makes sense to me. But then you mentioned this thing about the kind of the gravity and the dots in the earth thing. Yeah, so yeah. maybe go into that a little bit. Yeah, so, so, so people want to get a hall pass. They know that they're not at 180 strides per minute and, and they've struggled to finally try to get there and maybe have failed. And generally what ends up happening is their approach is wrong. They're not changing the way they're running. They're just hoping to cause it to be quicker. And if you continually overstride, it's going to be really hard to get your foot to come underneath you at that frequency. Okay. And so what you're talking about the dots on the ground, I wasn't sure what you were talking about, but now I know. Oh. Um, if you were to be, uh, if we're all standing in the street, so let's take a cross section of people, some really tall, some really short, some people in the middle. And we're all just standing in the street and there's a satellite view of us, right? Looking straight down on us. Gravity doesn't care how tall you are. 
It's going to put the same amount of force down on you as it will if you're short, you're tall, you're in the in between. So gravitational forces is what's really what we're dealing with here. Uh, does not care how tall you are, and so you can you you could just as readily have your stride frequency end up at 180 strides per minute as you could at six foot five, or if you're four foot nine. And, and you know when you talk about research, for me personally. I've had never a problem, maybe initially had a problem, but ultimately end up getting everyone that I meet that comes and gets on my treadmill or at a clinic that I, I, I put on is capable of hitting 180 strides per minute effectively. But they needed to change the way they were moving. And this is the disconnect for most people is they never change the way they move and expect that there's going to be a different outcome just because they're trying to increase their frequency. You know, it's just, it just doesn't work. You've got you to you gotta alter the way you're moving. And so the biggest alteration that I'm speaking of is that when your lower limb is extended beyond, beyond your knee, you're overstriding. So that's going to cause your contact point to be further away from you. And it's going to take longer for your foot to get beneath you. So unless you change that, and it's a simple alteration, all you got to do is flex the knee. And now what happens is so that simple. It, it is. As soon as you as soon as you start noticing after you flex the knee, that when you finally get your foot, entire foot to the ground, you're standing right over top of it. And it almost doesn't matter how far ahead of your body you reach initially, as long as your knee is flexed, by the time you get to the ground, you'll be standing right over top of that foot. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. And it's just that people don't even perceive that they're not flexing the knee. People are not even aware of the fact that they're actually landing on the heel rather than their forefoot. So perception is really the thing that needs to be altered. So one more point. Aside from mm -hmm. my observation, there was a study done at the University of Wisconsin. I don't recall how many years ago it was. It's been a while. But they basically looked at uh, the gait patterns of recreational runners. And what they found is that traditionally, if you didn't say anything and you just took a cross section of 100 runners back then, and say, okay, run. And we just want to see what's happening with you as you go through space. The average runner was at about 165 strides per minute. So they encourage people to increase their frequency by 5%. And that 5% increase uh, resulted in a 20% reduction in injuries at the ankle, knee, and hip. All right? Then they thought, wow, so maybe if we even increase it more, what then? So they encourage people to increase their stride frequency by 10%. And the yield was a 32% reduction in injury in those same regions. So, and it just turns out that a 10% increase over about 130, 165 puts you like right at about 180. And so voila, they realize that having contact points closer to the body at that frequency, which encourages that to occur, reduces injuries by 32%. So, if I can take an athlete and reduce the potential for injury by 32% because of the way I change the way they're moving, we're going to be able to train more often. And more often means more adaptation, right? And so aside from the fact that you're more stable when you land at that point, you're going to reduce injuries. But beyond that, from a performance perspective, if you get stable sooner and you don't have that lapse in stability that you have to overcome a collision your force production is going to be magnified, which means you're going to push your body through space much more quickly, much more readily, much more efficiently, and at less cost. So that would be my argument for why I want to see most of my athletes at least adhere commonly to 180 strides per minute. And the reason I say mm -hmm. commonly, because the other question people are going to ask is, well, do you stay there all the time? And it, my answer would be, it depends. Now, if you can produce greater and greater speeds without having to violate that frequency, then sure, stay there the majority of the time. Now, if you're trying to pass somebody and you're economical at 180 strides per minute and you're still putting pressure on this guy, you could briefly bring your cadence up even quicker to produce more result. But you don't want to pull the trigger on that too often because you start to teach yourself to reach for too much cadence and too much cadence starts to develop more cost. There's my point. Mm -hmm.
So I, I'm going to throw VJ a little bit under the bus here because I was talking to him about this and he said it, so you can tell him if he's wrong. But he had said something about if you're a taller person doing easy, easy runs, sometimes you might not always be at exactly 180. It might be a little bit less because you are 6'3", six, 6'4", six, with super long legs. And that's more important for doing your harder efforts because instead of like, because we always thought of 180 as, oh, I got to speed up my cadence to 180. But once you kind of get used to that, it might be more important for you on your speedy runs to be slowing down that cadence, just like you were saying, instead of running at a, a 190 cadence to go fast. Now you're working super hard, slowing that down to 180. But the slow runs, maybe you would be a little lower than that. Do you have any opinions on that? Or would you Absolutely. say slow runs are pretty much always 180? <laughs> of course I have an opinion on that. So um, <laughs> uh, first of all, I, don't, I can't think of a time where it would be wise to, while you're running, to intentionally slow your cadence below that, that stride frequency. Okay. Because again, it's just suggesting that whether slow or fast, the, the frequency it takes when you slow it down is gonna cause you to overstride and or cause you to lurch up and down. And none hmm. of those are beneficial to you structurally. So aside from you know just taking it easy peasy or whatever, you, you, you could very effectively run at 180 strides per minute and have a slower pace, as well as being able to run much faster at the same frequency. So uh, I just don't think, I, I, I can see the rationale for increasing the frequency, especially on shorter distance events. Like if you're gonna run like a 400 and you're in the last yeah. 100 of the 400 and you need to crank it out, because you know it's at the end of the road isn't just a little bit down the road, um, yeah, it's going to get expensive, but it's not going to hurt you. There's no good time or no good argument for overstriding because yeah. it's damaging and it's, it's putting you in an untenable position when you land. So I just can't, I just can't abide it. I can't, I can't give you a good reason to do that. Um, and so are I, you saying that if you're doing under 180, you are automatically going to be over overstriding? Like what if you were going 178 and you had super long limbs and stuff and you were still landing perfectly under your body each time, but you were at 177, 178, The, the length of like your that. limbs has nothing to do with the, the, the contact point with the ground. Okay. Right? So I guess. The, the, re the reason you're leaving the ground is because you pushed off. And when you return to the ground in the course of that gait cycle, right? So if you slow it down, whether you have a longer leg or a shorter leg, you're going to have to reach ahead of yourself to accommodate that gait cycle because a taller person isn't pushed on the ground harder than a shorter person. Yeah, but wouldn't, I mean, their limbs being longer, maybe this is just me, but like wouldn't little limbs be like a little wheel and bigger limbs be like a bigger wheel that might take longer to get around? I don't know. Maybe that's just my brain thinking of it no, wrong. Because look at it. It's a function of you leaving the ground and returning to earth. Right? Yeah. This is it. Timeline. And if you want to be, if you want to reach further, or if you want to move your legs slower, you'll have to reach further. It's really a function of gravitational forces and how much time you're up off the ground or not. And the, the, the thing that matters where cadence is concerned and running and moving through space is the length of time that you're in flight relative to contact with the earth. And if you want to be in contact with the earth slower, you've got to go higher or you have to reach further. Mm. So both of those are a mistake. And can I tell you something? Generally, they both work together. So the further out you reach, the higher up you got to go because it's going to take longer for you to get back in cycle. So it's, it's really okay. kind of a physics issue, you know? Okay. And it's really, and I'm not much of a physicist, so <laughs> that's I understand. <laughs> Getting into the flow method, so you recently did a podcast with Bracken and Kirk for the Running Public, and there were some certain certain things that we felt weren't exactly like that you and I, as in we, weren't exactly clear and weren't like understood. And I think just some of the analogies were falling on deaf ears, and it just it just wasn't coming across. So we're going to kind of go into a little more in depth, especially some of the things that listening to it, we thought could be quite, people could have questions about or that they had questions about. So uh, the first, and I think one of the 
biggest things that I always kind of wondered with the flow method and something they brought up was how do you avoid taking it too easy with the flow method? Because I think when people hear flow method and they hear your just initial kind of description of it of, oh, well, it's like percentages of a run. You start out easy and you kind of push up into your difficult and go down and then up. They think, oh, well, if I as soon as it starts to get hard, then I taper back down and recover. I'm never really pushing myself. I'm never really like exerting myself to the max and I could just be making excuses every time. It's like, oh, well, that, that was kind of hard. So I'm going to go back down then and take it easy. So we're going to kind of go into that and just go over some of the main points of why that doesn't really happen as much in the flow method as you would think it would and some ways you can kind of avoid that and work through that in the flow method. So do you want to kind of start or do you want me to go over my bullet points? No, I, you know, I, I totally understand. And, and I, I do agree that, um, and I told you myself that when I left that podcast, I felt that um, I didn't I didn't clearly answer questions as well as I'd like to. Uh, I didn't feel like I was getting across to them. Um, they weren't getting it. And I don't think it was really their fault. I think to, to, in great part, it was my fault that I wasn't explaining it quite well. So they were gathering, and based on what you had suggested, is that the flow maybe gives you a little too much creative license. So in order to perform more, you need to push yourself is their, their mindset. And they're feeling like, well, you know, you're not really giving, you're giving yourself too much latitude. And then, so you're never really going to get to this place where uh, you're going to perform at this, this high level because you're kind of like just flowing along and just, you know, lollygagging down the road because you'd never really want to push. And that is by no means my intention. Um, what I'm suggesting is that, you know, try to appreciate I'm coming from having done clinical analysis on athletes for many, many, many moons. And I, I um, have been dictating to people, okay, here is what the intensity should be today. Here's, you know, we're going to do this lactate tolerance workout. This is what I want you to do. I might suggest to you, I want you to do it for five minutes or we'll give you a particular timeline, which you're going to press yourself. And this is traditionally done where you're, you're dictating to people where the intensity should be, and it becomes a pass or fail kind of scenario. Um, so let's say, for example, and I'm going to use the analogy that, that he was kind of stuck on, was doing a track workout. So let's just say that I want you to do, and I'm, I'm speaking as a traditional coach now for a moment, I want you to do 10 400s, and I want them to be on um, 75 seconds. So we're going to keep these 10 400s under 75 seconds. I'm just throwing it out there. And then I'm going to dictate the recovery. I want you to recover uh, one minute. Or let's give you, even give you a distance. So we're going to give you a 200-meter recovery, right? And But all of these 400s need to be under 75 seconds. So the first one you do it, easy peasy, no problem. The second one you attempt to do, a little bit more problematic. Maybe you need more recovery but you don't get it because you're stuck on that recovery timeline. Uh, and then the next one you try, you know, you're falling short of the timeline or, or you're extending the timeline. So now it's 80 seconds rather than 75. And then you still require more recovery that you were, that you were, that your body required. Um, and, but you're not getting it. Right. And so then the whole workout starts to fall apart. And so you go home disheveled, you had 10 repetitions you're supposed to do under 75, and it didn't work out. Maybe you call your coach and say, dude, you know, I was, real, I was doing fine for a while, and then I failed. And so it becomes a pass or fail kind of situation, right? With flow, what I would suggest is that you're going to approach intensity, but you're going to approach it as your body um, allows. So, for example, if I go in and I get real toxic, so the lactate production in my body is really becoming untenable, but I'm trying to shove through it, it's going to take longer for this lactate to be uh, rid from my body in order for me to produce quality work again. But I just kind of blew that off and just said, no, I'm going to force my way through this. And all the time I keep trying to force my way through this untenable situation, you don't develop any, t any uh, adaptation from that process. So if I allowed myself a little latitude, so I'm going to recover when my body says, okay, you're ready to go again. I'm not going to stick there. I'm not going to always do those workouts exactly the same. I'm looking for opportunities. So maybe initially, incidentally, knowing we're going to have this conversation today, 
I did an experiment this morning. All right. So let me give you the analogy. I'm on my, my bike erg. All right. And I'm going to be on my bike erg for 20,000 meters. And so I'm at a, a fixed amount of load. I'm, I'm, I'm at, uh, I got the damper set at like two and a half. So it's easy work. And so my goal is I'm going to set it on watts and I want to see how many watts I can produce max effort. And so I've got a real adequate warm up. I'm about 10 minutes in. I said, okay, I'm ready to do this. Boom. I, I try to shoot up and I end up with X amount of watts. I'm not going to go through my performances with people, but let's just say, let's just say for argument's sake that I produce 200 watts and then it's starting to really burn and I got to, I got to back off. So I back off. And I allow myself to recover adequately. And when I feel like I feel this perceptively, I feel like, okay, I can do this again. The second time I try it, I get 240. The third time I try it, I get 300. And then I'm starting to notice not only am I producing more and more work, but the amount of time it requires to recover is actually improving. What am I getting? I'm getting a temporary adaptation. But I'm not saying, oh, well, I just got to be chill. I don't want to work harder. I'm looking for opportunities. I'm looking for an opportunity for me to produce more work, but I'm starting to identify that when I start to flow and I start to give my body a chance to identify what to do with the circumstance, and the circumstance being is this lactate acidosis. So we're, we're actually getting acidic and our body's trying to figure out, okay, let's move some of this lactate out of the way so we can, we can produce this work that he's asking me to produce. So there's, there's this internal mechanism that's trying to identify what the solution is to the given problem. But rather than just going as hard as I can, hard as I can, hard as I can on a fixed timeline, I'm not going to yield any improvements. I'm going to start getting shut down right about the same spot every stinking time. And, and then what's going to end up happening is, if anything, my, my workloads are going to start to degenerate. I'm going to start doing less and less work. So all I'm suggesting is by becoming more congruent with my body's capacity to produce work, giving my brain and my body a chance to do its thing, I start to yield better and better progress. That's what flow is about. It's not about, you know, taking its chill and hoping one day the moon and stars are going to line up. It's not like that at all. I just know that through, through experimentation that, and time and time again, if you allow your, your body to get involved in the decision-making processes, how to move that. By the way, the central nervous system is a big player in all this too. So let's get past the lactic acid for a minute. Your CNS identifies this increase in load you're creating and it becomes, um, it becomes concerned. Realize that the, the principal uh, responsibility of your central nervous system is to protect you from harm. So your body identifies this workload that you're creating as potential harm. And so one of the mechanisms that it generates in order to, to keep you from harm's way is it generates lactate. Think about that for a minute. It's almost like a mechanism to keep you from killing yourself, right? And by the way, motor skill drills are like this. And I've been doing those motor skill drills well before I was ever doing uh, uh, this flow mechanism. And those allowances that you get, these hall passes that you get from the central nervous system, when you regress and progress and regress and progress, start to open up. You're, you start to get a hall pass from your CNS. It says, you know what? You didn't die last time. We can go a little harder this time. And so we're looking for improvements in opportunity. We're not trying to make things easy for people. We're trying to make uh, greater allowances, greater capacity to, to process lactate and whichever mechanism it is, whether it be to vacate the majority of it through carbon dioxide uh, release or whether it's going to shuttle it into parts of the body to sit, whether it's going to be reduced as, uh, as um, water and through vapor. You just, you, your body's trying to find ways to move that lactate. And if you try to shove it into an untenable position, you're not going to win. And this is what I fear in traditional training programs, is you've got this dictum that you're chasing, and it's just not bearing fruit. And certainly, I mean... You're going to, you do anything often enough, you're going to get some progress from it. I'm just saying that doing this the way I'm suggesting improves your capacity to, to do, do work. Mm -hmm. I hope that helped. <laughs> We're going to challenge ourselves on occasion, but this is almost like a test bed. Mm -hmm. I often have athletes time trial. <clears throat> 
So we're trying to measure our progress. So all the stimulus that you're throwing at your body is going to result in some kind of outcome. It's either going to be a regressive outcome or a progressive outcome. Generally, it never stays the same. So we, 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 the whole concept of flow is to become more, as I suggested, congruent with the, the body's responses. We want to get an adoptive response. And we want to allow, we don't want to force our body to do something it's not prepared to do. We want to start to educate the body and let the body identify what it is we're trying to accomplish and identify also that it's safe to do it. Because again, I'm using the word safe because your brain doesn't like it when you go too hard. So you, this flow method is introducing more and more uh, either volume or intensity and giving your body a chance to create solutions to the ensuing production of lactate or whatever, whatever the danger might be. And so then on occasion, we'll, we'll, you know, the task that you're preparing for is 1K efforts. So you got to check it. You got to say, okay, I'm going to go out for 1K hard as I can. What happens? This is part of the training process. So you, you know, as I suggested, I think in the workout is a four by one. So mm -hmm. we're going to recover. And I think I threw a timeline in for recovery mm -hmm. better than that. I think it was a, a heart rate response for recovery. Um, and traditionally what I'll do instead of saying, okay, I want you to recover for a minute. That timeline has nothing to do with your body. You, you, but if your heart rate reduces to say in your case, let's say it comes down to 110 beats per minute. You prob the reason it's down that low is because you're probably adequately uh, re recovered. And so let's say that you just, on the timeline, in one minute, your heart rate didn't come down to about 140. Well, think of your, think of your heart rate like a fan in the room with smoke, right? The fan kicks in when smoke shows up and it blows the smoke out of the room. The air is clear, fan shuts off. So you've, you've got a thermostat that's operating to either... Or you could think in terms of heat and cold, right? So my thermostat will kick in when it gets to X temperature, tries to clear the heat from the room, boom, it settles back down when the, when the heat's gone. Your body's operating like that. Your heart rate response is, it's what it's doing is it's churning metabolic waste out of the body. And when it's got the job done, heart rate recovers, right? So your heart rate is a better uh, dictum than time. Because mm -hmm. you may not have all the smoke cleared out of the room in, in one minute. And, and or you might have got the smoke cleared out of the room in 30 seconds, in which case you over recovered. And you don't want to give yourself too much of a break. So let's just say hypothetically that I want you to do, I'm using, using another analogy. Let's just say we're doing hill repeats. And let's say that the hill is 60 seconds and at about a 20% uh, uh, inclination. So you run hard up to the top, you come back down. It took you to 175 beats per minute when you got to the top. By the time you get back down to the bottom, your heart rate's 150, right? If you go back up that hill at 150, your heart rate's going to go to 185, if it can. And then when you come back down, if you, if you try to go back up by the time you got to the bottom again, your heart rate's going to start at 160. So progressively, what's going to happen is you're not going to get that regression in heart rate because your heart's working its ass off to try to clear the smoke from the room. It's trying to get that mm -hmm. lactate out, right? So now let's just say that you're governing the recovery to 120 beats per minute. Every time you come back to, the, to that 120 beats per minute, you're going to have the same amount of recovery as you had the previous set, the previous set, previous set, right? So the quality of work is going to be consistent. Now, let's just say that you start noticing that the timeline to get to 120 is shorter and shorter and shorter. We may want to up that recovery time to 140 beats per minute because your body's clearing the smoke from the room much quicker than it used to, which is testament of your, your ability to process that lactate. It's testament of your recovery, mm -hmm. which is very consistent with your uh, capacity to uh, perform better. So... And then the whole idea of paying attention to your heart rate is like that perception and paying attention to your body. Now you just got now you just got a metric to work with, rather than this outside intervention, which might be time. You see that? So when you think of yeah. flow, 
When you think of flow, think that, that and I never, never said this before, it just occurred to me, that internal mechanism that you're paying attention to is part of this flow process. This is your, your identification of response to work. It's just giving you, you know, a, a message saying, okay, you're cool. You're right. You're cool. You're ready to go again. Mm -hmm. As opposed to go, oh, geez, it's already a minute. I got to go now, you know, and mm -hmm. that has nothing to do with you. So I'm just suggesting with flow, the, the biggest consideration of flow versus so many other approaches is it's taking into account what your body's doing, what your body's responding to, and you paying attention to that response and giving it the respect it requires. That's basically what it boils down mm -hmm. to. That makes sense because, I mean, you think about it, it's basically just a more personalized version of the same track workouts they were doing from the beginning. I mean, instead of just saying, oh, well, a minute is the magic number, even though every single person's body is going to respond differently and they're going to have a different amount of recovery, they're going to have a different amount that takes them to clear that lactate, all that. Now you're actually paying attention to your body. And if you have a specific goal, like you were saying, shuttling that lactate away quickly and really focusing on that, now you're giving your body that time to actually do it before it goes into the next so, so you know it's funny up. i use the track analogy and i gotta tell you long before this is an epiphany i just had long before i wrote that book i had great exception with traditional track workouts because it just didn't didn't seem to make any sense to me so why do people go to the track to work out they call it a speed workout they're going to go do speed so they have this dictum, they're going to go, I'm going to do 400s or I'm going to do 800s or I'm going to do 1200s. They might mix it all up, but they've got this distance on a governed track and effort that they're going to apply, right? So let's just say that I, me and 10 friends go to the track and we got the script and the script says we're doing 10 400s and two 1200s, whatever, whatever it might be, right? But we're also suggesting that our recovery times are going to be static. We're going to recover one minute after each of these efforts, right? So you're gonna start seeing the wheat separate from the chaff very quickly. You got three people that are able to do it for the first four rounds. Two people able to do it for the next couple rounds. One person may be able to do it before they fail. And what they're doing, aside from the fact that they're not getting enough recovery, is they're slowing down. So you're progressively reducing the amount of work that you're creating because fatigue is taking over. And now it's a suffer fest. So now what you're doing is you're basically beating the, the crap out of yourself and hoping one day it's going to yield progress. And to, honestly, you could you could beat a horse as often as you want. Doesn't necessarily mean it's going to run faster, right? And you know you might get a little incremental improvement in your capacity to work, but it's not going to be uh, as progressive as if you took into account the way your body responds to work. And so, by the way, that's that was in my head. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I had really took exception with a traditional track workout for that very reason. So I always had in, in, invoked heart race responses as a dictum for the workouts on the track and started to notice amazing results from people when they did that. And so this is just an evolution of that whole experiential process yeah. that I've been involved in. It just got to a place where I thought, wow, we're just not giving enough credit to how our body responds and paying attention on, on the fly. What should we be doing based on what's occurring to me right now? Rather than somebody mm -hmm. just indicating to me that I got to do this, 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 and this in this order. And I think what, if you think, because again, the question was, how do you avoid taking it too easy? It's not, you're not always just paying attention to like, oh, how does this feel? It feels hard. So I'm going to stop. You have your heart rate. If you have a chest strap and a watch that you can look at your heart rate, you finish that rep, your recovery isn't necessarily just based on like, oh, how I feel about this. It's no, I've recovered by this many beats per minute. So I'm recovered. I still might not feel like going and doing another rep, but my heart rate says I can. So, all right, let's go. So it's, you're not, it's not just completely based on feeling, you know? And I think that's something a lot of people get confused about. Your heart rate is a, a mean trainer too. I mean, when it hits that 120, if you're ready or you're not, whatever, that you've talked to your coach about set up. I mean, well, I don't know if that I makes sense something? or not. But. I, I would argue that you'll find that by allowing this recovery to occur based on that metric, based on the information come from your body, more often than not, you'll be ready to go. Yeah. You're not going to be like, oh man, my heart rate says 120. I don't want to do this again. 
Yeah. Your heart rate won't be at 120 if you don't want to do it again. <laughs> well, and I think, I think the more what I'm trying to say is like, I think a lot of people are saying, well, what if I'm not feeling motivated? Well, what if I'm not feeling great? You know, I just don't want to do it. I mean, that's something we don't really ever talk about much because we're more talking about the training, but it's like, that happens too. You might be in the middle of a workout. It's like, I don't want to do this. I'm sure my body can, can do I it, but I don't want to. Then, and I think that then, then you probably shouldn't do it. Can I just give you that? I mean, honestly, so, so when you start pushing yourself beyond your body's want, you might be dancing with the potential of injury. There, mm-hmm. there may be a reason why your body doesn't want to do it today, right? And you may not, if you don't respect that, uh, I mean, let's be, there's a, there's, a, there's a fine line between being lazy and being intuitive. And mm-hmm. when you start to identify that, wow, I, this is just not going well for me right now, um, and I should just scuttle the mission, just go home. That would, that in many cases, that may be the prudent decision. Just paying attention to what your body's telling you and deciding that, you know what? Today's not the day. Can I tell you how many times yeah. I have athletes tell me that? Where, you know, I, I might write a script worth of training for the week with all the best intentions, even based on conversations we've had. And they say, you know, I was going to go out and do this yesterday, but man, it just was not in the cards for me. So I cut it short or I, I decided to do something different. I just took a little recovery run or whatever. And you know what my argument is? None. I'm like, you're right. Probably the thing to do. You're paying attention Mm -hmm. to what your body's telling you. Now, on the flip side of that is that when you start to get into this relationship with responses to work and allowing your your body to get involved in the decision-making processes, you'll find that there'll be more progression than there will be regression. You'll start to notice that you don't get over the top too often and your body's still promoting more and more uh, outcome. And what what occurred last week, which unfortunately we weren't able to get on because of all the hiccups we had with uh, technical stuff, I brought a prime example to play here. I had Blue Benedum, who's an elite uh, marathoner, you know, get on for a little bit, and his connection was terrible, so we just scuttled the whole thing. But I will share with you that Here's a guy that when he would run, uh, by the way, we looked at we looked at his heart rate responses for the Boston Marathon. Um, I think it was in 2017, I think it was. And his average heart rate was around 160 beats per minute to yield about a 545 average pace. This year, going into Boston on a 20-mile time trial, his average heart rate, ready, was about 131 beats per minute, and he was producing faster times. He At mile 10 in, in his time trial, he ran a 457 pace. His heart rate was 131. Okay? Mm-hmm. On mile 17, his, his uh, pace was 508. His heart rate was 128. So here's someone that followed very, very, very clearly. He followed the training regimen that I provided for him. He took great liberty in allowing his body to dictate when it was time and when it wasn't time. And that's the kind of outcome he was having with his training. He told me that traditionally he would run upwards of 100 plus miles a week in training for preparation for a marathon during the flow He never got past 60 miles a week because when it just didn't feel like it was in the cards, he didn't do it. His performances Mm -hmm. improved, his recovery improved, and everything about his performances improved. So uh, if someone says, well, you know, you got this little liberty to do this and that, well, hello, how about let's do less work and end up with better progress? (laughs) There, I think that's the that's the key. More money, <laughs> <laughs> more money, less work, more money. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, another one that people ask a lot is, are all workouts the same then? Because I think we have like our specific flow workouts we no. kind of bring up on podcasts no. and all that. Yeah, that yeah that's people. that's 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 a great question because no, they're not. So where where the training concepts that I'm espousing relative to what is traditional is that I will agree that if you're leading towards a longer event, you're going to need more volume. 
And if it's a longer event, you're going to want to lean more readily on your endurance capacity, which means that the, there's going to be a higher percentage of low intensity volume in the flow cycles. So you may have a flow cycle where 70% of the flow cycle is prominently aerobic. Um, but if the, if the type of training you're uh, putting down for a particular event is greater intensity, shorter duration, the intensity is going mm -hmm. to be greater throughout and the amount of dedication to aerobic conditioning is going to be less uh, because it's just not required of you, right? So um, you expand and contract the volume, but all the players are going to be involved. You're going to have aerobic conditioning, anaerobic conditioning. There are going to be more max type efforts involved, regardless of the type of training you're preparing for. It's just a function of how much volume you're going to bring to the table, and that volume will be progressive. So you may have workouts in the week that are more intense, dedicated to more intensity and workouts that are less intense and longer of duration. It just depends on what you're preparing for, but you mold the workouts relative to task and they're all still flowing. They're just flowing at various intensities based on demand or based on needs. Mm -hmm. And they could be doing different things. Like I think a lot of people, cause you talk about run flow so often, a lot of people who do high rocks like me or OCR Spartan races, they think, Oh, so I'm just going to be running a flow every single day. No, like you'll still be doing, I mean, you can tell me if I'm wrong on this, but flow is an endurance training approach. Some workouts work on things other than endurance. So you might be doing some skill workouts some days. You might be doing some lifting workouts some days. Not every single day necessarily are you going to be doing a flow and like run. You could be doing a flow high rocks training. Like a lot of my stuff that you have me do is I'll, like, I don't, there's very few days a week that I just run for high rocks. There's some. But then a lot of the days I'll be doing running mixed with certain ones of the high rocks workouts. So some, some days I might be focusing on burpees and lunges. Some days I might be working on the sled push and other things. So it'll be each day. I mean, like you look at my work week, if you didn't know I was doing like a flow training, you wouldn't look at my work week and be like, oh, you're doing flow training. It would look pretty standard. Like it would look a lot more like a normal high rocks training plan even if you didn't know about the flow well, so, it, I so, guess. So let's just be clear. First of all, this will be your first High Rocks event. And mm -hmm. there are some things that we needed to educate you in. So we're talking about specificity. So I've been early on really trying to get you uh, more engaged in some of the skill techniques and uh, applications that you're not comfortable with yet. Meaning mm -hmm. that you don't own a ski erg or a bike erg or you know, some of these devices that you might have to face in an event like that. So I've been pretty intense about putting those in front of you so that you can make mm -hmm. your way through that and become friends with it, right? So uh, another athlete might be approached a different way. So let's just say mm -hmm. that you came from CrossFit or something, you're really well-schooled in those type of applications, but your running sucks. Right about now, we'd be run intensive, right? So we're going to, you and I are going to circle back to the running once we start to make friends with these other toys. So the, I haven't dispatched the need for specificity by any stretch. I'm really being um, very pointed about the things that I think we, you and I need to address th at this point in the game. But believe mm -hmm. me when I tell you, we're coming back to the run. We're already starting to bleed it in here and there and more high intensity running because I'm, I'm just really trying to make sure this is tightened up. Um, so so you, you get what I'm saying? is that um, mm -hmm. it's not like, okay, we're flowing, everything else doesn't matter. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like that at all. You know, there's specificity, okay? And you, when you, so, as soon as you start getting away from specificity, you're going to get into trouble. Uh, we got to first identify, okay, what are our challenges? What are the things that we need to be very, very good at, right? And where have we dropped the ball? Or what are we a babe in the woods with? So for you to come off of a skier well, you're going to need to make friends with that skier. Now, I'm not suggesting you can't flow on that skier or on the rower or even in a, in a wall ball. But at the end of the day, it comes down to basically brute force and untiring application for those, I'll call it 16 events, eight runs, Eight events. So, but um, 
if I was to say, okay, we're going to spend 5,000 meters on the rower today, I would want you, I would advocate that you start to really approach kind of a flow into that effort. Same thing on the ski erg. Um, but we're going to get back to the challenge, which is we got to go 1,000 meters on this thing, and our average pace needs to be X. But that's like a time trial, right? For me, that's a time trial. There's going to be, we're going to check our business, but we may do things in training that may not be as uh, seemingly applicable as the high intensity, go hard as you can for a thousand meters type of an effort. But the training mm -hmm. that's preparing you to be able to do that may not be the same as what you're trying to, you follow what I'm saying? So you're kind following of, yeah. the training to prepare for the capacity to slam down that 1K, right? Mm -hmm. And that might be the 1K on the run. That could be the 1K on the whatever. Um, so yeah, um, you're still flowing, uh, even though it's high intensity and the application is not going to look the same every day, not by even a little bit. Cool. I think that was the point we we're trying to make. Cool. All right. And then I had, it sounds like you're, you have stuff going on. So I, I really kind of wanted to hit this one last thing, which is something that Bracken and Kirk brought up on their follow-up podcast was what's your uh, opinion on periodized training? Because they were saying one, one point that they feel like they didn't get to ask you at all was, is your training going to be changing then throughout the years going into events? Cause one thing you always say, or you've talked about a lot is that you don't say you don't prescribe like an aerobic training block and then let's go into your speed block and all that do you have any any sort of periodization that you recommend or apply well, for let's, your let's 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 take a look at periodization for a minute and l let me share with you and i think i even shared it in the book you probably didn't get to that page yet is that okay. the godfather of periodization is a fellow by the name of tudor bumpa who is okay. a romanian exercise scientist who is almost single-handedly responsible for the gold medals that occurred in the USR, USSR before the wall came down, okay? Mm -hmm. And he created the concept of periodization. And periodization is nothing more than arranging work over time in a progressive yeah. fashion. And he would write programs leading into the, to the Olympics that he might pick up an athlete four years early and then have intent that is pre preordained leading up to four years down the road. And so that's a pretty big periodized plan, but you can mm -hmm. neck this down to three months, four months, six months, a year, whatever based on demand you're trying to create. Now, um, when you talk, let's talk about OCR for a minute because these guys are OCR guys, right? I don't know how periodization works in an OCR type of program. Why? Because racing occurs too often. And erasing occurs too random, right? So trying to build up to a particular end, end game in, in a sport where the, the, the races are so randomized uh, and particularly maybe doing three events in a, in a given weekend. So I'm going to do a beast, I'm going to do a sprint, and I'm going to do a super, or I might do a super, a beast, and an ultra beast, right? So the needs for those specific events are different. And so periodization is about arranging work over time and intensity. So the idea being is that planned progression, planned regression, and, and hopefully super compensation, where you've done some work, you recovered from it. When you come back, you come back stronger. So you're hoping that this ladder is just going to progressively climb and climb and climb and climb. And so that's very, very specific to any particular outcome. And so to periodize on a randomized process is very difficult. Uh, if you were running a marathon, yes, the program is periodized. What's the difference? Is that there's a planned amount of progression. There's a planned amount of volume increases. There's a planned amount of regression. And there's a planned amount of intensity that you're hoping is going to take you to the holy grail event, right? And so uh, to suggest that I've just not looked at per, uh, periodization, sure. I have, and I and I, believe me when I tell you I understand it. I, I literally made sat down with a guy that is the single most uh, important person in the concept of periodization in the world. I get it. I understand what we, we're trying to get done here. It's just in this sport, it's kind of funny. It's just tough. Now let me tell you that for you, you're training for high rocks specificity. The distances don't change. 
the, mm-hmm. the tasks don't change. It's just a function of what events we're preparing for. So we could very readily periodize you up to an event like that and have great outcomes. We could even have intermittent B, B events that we're going to hope to be at a particular level to get to those events. And that's going to be the, the, the springboard to get to greater intensities and greater events. So that's easier to, to plan than, than, by the way, they threw a, a race up this week. I think I'm going to go do it. <laughs> that, that's kind of that's yeah. kind of what the what the nature of the sport is has been in, in my experience. And but can I tell you something? Coming from events like triathlon and running and stuff like this in the past, that always frustrated me because I'm like, how how do you train somebody for something that's going to happen every week? You know, where do where do you start? Mm-hmm. And where do you end with this guy? You know, it's just really hard to do. Yeah. So I guess a little more in depth on that. So you were saying the periodized training is in building up to a specific event. And one thing that they've always, they talk a lot about is having the, the blocks of training, like the aerobic block, the speed block, the threshold block, that kind of stuff. Do you have any sort of, I mean, even just saying like right now I'm working on more of the skills and the specificity in a sense, that's almost like a block of training to me. Um, do you ever break apart? Like have, Oh, well you're a beginning athlete training for an ultra. So we're going to have you really focus most of your work on just pure aerobic, nothing like that. No, because this is the flaw (laughs) in the whole process that they say, you know, after all these years and all this money and all this stuff, why, why now does he say that that's been wrong? So let's Mm -hmm. just say that, uh, you're training for a beast event. And so I'm going to say, I want you to spend the first 10 weeks doing an aerobic build. That's a block okay. of training, so to speak. And now we've, we've satisfied that demand and we're going to move into the next. That's called linear periodization processes. Okay. Okay. There was a time years ago where a guy put his hand up and said, well, I got a question. Why would you invest 10 weeks in a particular application when you're summarily going to reduce all the benefits that you gained in those 10 weeks when you start going into that next block? So when you segregate the processes and you go from aerobic to anaerobic, you're basically losing all the benefits you you spent time developing and hoping that that's going to carry the day. It's just a bad idea. I'm still going to get a, a, a an aggressively amount of aerobic conditioning in a training plan, not a block, but I'm not going to leave any of the other elements that are necessary for success at that event off the table. We're going to okay. visit- that that's I think my question then. Let's say you do that. Let's say you have your this person, let's just say a new athlete, their events in a year. For the first few months, you have them doing everything. Would you theoretically have them doing more aerobic and less of that other stuff in the beginning and more of that other stuff towards the end as they get closer to the event? Like, yeah, you still have it all, but it would you be a, switching just, yeah, out? Yeah, so the, 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 <clears throat> the percentages of application will always vary. And, and it may, you know, in a periodized fashion, it may start to reduce the amount of intent aerobically versus the other applications but all of but conceptually they're all going to be present and Mm -hmm. there may be times where in a training workout or even a week i may have more um more involvement in the higher intensity versus the aerobic condition that could very easily Mm -hmm. happen um but the the chief difference between what i'm selling versus what is traditional is I don't want to segregate the processes. I think there needs to be inclusion rather than separation of these intensities. Uh, because mm-hmm. as soon as you divorce yourself from one thing, the other thing starts to win. And as soon as you- Okay, so then on that, my question on that then would be is, so one thing I've heard kind of is like, oh, you can't work on your aerobic and your speed at the same time. Can you still hear me? Okay. Um, or you're just going to wear yourself out. Are you literally just trying to raise everything up evenly the whole time? Or could it be, well, right now I'm going to mainly focus on aerobic and then we'll even out. We're going to really no, focus no, on the anaerobic no. so, kind of so thing. So the, like, the assumption, think of, forget about the, the elements. What is the end okay. game? The end game is performance. Yeah. So what we're really looking to do is elevate the performance. And mm-hmm. the, the applications that are in play collectively – should enhance your performance. And so we're going to manipulate those elements as needed based on the outcomes of the training. So there may come a time where we feel like we're going to lay back and get a little bit more air because we're just not handling the toxicity well. Um, Mm. But 
we're never going to say, oh, gosh, we shouldn't have never done that anaerobic training because we're losing our aerobic conditioning. Because yeah. the, 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 the whole concept of aerobic conditioning is sparing the, the carbohydrate stores and having better access to fat as an energy source. And I'm going to tell you something. People don't win races aerobically. They win races anaerobically. You're not going to – you start winning races when you don't have to do anything but ch chug along at 120 beats per minute. You weren't in a race, you know. You you know, no, I was going to say something. I'm not going to say it, but, um, <laughs> but at the end of the day, um, it's just hard for people to let go of old concepts because they yeah. just assume, because they've been in play for so long, they must be true. We mm -hmm. learn this is, we're going into 2022. Okay. There's an evolution in our capacities to produce all sorts of knowledge, Right. And the advantages I've had over the years were, were different than the advantages someone might have had 30 years prior to my existence, right? Yeah. And there, are, there, there are coaches out there back in the day that were great coaches relative to the tools they had in their, in their, in their bag. And I just have more tools than they had. And there will be people behind me that will have more tools than me. And so we're evolving mm -hmm. in our processes. And someone to suggest that you couldn't learn a new trick that you got to just adhere to what everybody told you 10 years, 20 years ago. I just feel sorry for them. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. I just feel sorry for someone that doesn't want to learn or doesn't want to grow. All right. Yeah. I feel like we really went over all the questions that, I don't know, kind of the main FAQs. And I think, yeah, if anyone has anything else that was confusing, I feel like the more info we give, probably the more confusing yeah, it's going to well, be sometimes. You know, so. <laughs> my standard answer, and it would, seem, it would seem like the the thing for me to say, and it is, is just read the damn book. I mean, if you think I'm crazy, don't judge me until you read the book. You know, and I don't, I don't mean part of it. I mean, you need to read the entire book because there's going to be solutions to some of the questions you might have early on. <laughs> that might be answered later and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So pay attention to it. People always want to skim. They don't, oh, geez, I just want to get to the real good parts, you know? And then they leave out the things that were necessary. It's like, I, I had the analogy I was using the other day about learning to type. You know, you start looking at the keys, you're screwed, you know? Then you're never going to learn how to type because you're going to be dependent on those keys, right? Oh, yeah, oh, there they are, uh, you know? And that is a... And I hate this because I, you're, you're, you're one of the culprits. You're just typing away and you're, you know, I like, I want to punch you because you know, you learn how to do it. I couldn't do it. And now I, here I am, you know, an old man, I'm screwed. I, I just cannot type now. Right? <laughs> Mavis Beacon, get yourself some Mavis Beacon. <laughs> well, what you got to do is you got to learn the fundamentals so that you can apply yourself more yeah. appropriately. That's all. It and I actually just heard an analogy in that the other day too. It was about, learning how to play music and about how, oh, I just wanted to learn how to play a song on the guitar. Yeah. Okay, you might learn how to play a song, but if you don't actually know how to play music, you'll you'll never really know how to play that song. You just measure or memorized a couple notes and you plunked them away at the same, at the right time. It's like, Unless you are not a musician. Does <laughs> yeah. B.B. King do that? B. B. I don't know. B.B. <laughs> King didn't read music. You know, oh, gosh. But it's like, even if you, you don't know. necessarily know how to read it. But how does how it works? Either. How it works. He just has intuition. He knows if I push <laughs> my finger down on this string and pluck it, it's going to sound like this. And if I put these five yeah. together, it's going to sound like that. And he just created music, you know. And it, there it's, you go. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't want BB King to teach me how to play the guitar because yeah. I wouldn't know how to do it the way BB King does it. You know, I need mm -hmm. somebody to show me what this means so I can understand it down the road. And, yep. and that's got the running mechanics are like that. And the flow cycles, again, um, the, it's kind of a B personality thing. You need to just allow your body to pay attention and, and draw from it. And, and, and that's, uh, I just think it's a great education. So love it or hate it, read it. Then you can decide whether it makes sense or not. You know, and, and by the way, if it starts to work for you, for the 30 odd bucks or whatever it costs to get a book, if it didn't work out for you, you're not really, you know, you're not dead in the water. It's not like it ruined your life. Right. <laughs> or, or even if you, you might tried, have got extra recovery. You, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to give it a shot and I'm just going to follow it and try it and see which. By the way, there are people that have done that. As a matter of fact, there's a guy yeah. out there that writes for one of the uh, OCR, you know, blogs or whatever. 
he did exactly that. Older dude bought the book and did exactly what the book dictated with the training template. By the way, hmm. he used to, he needed the training template. He followed the template verbatim. And now I see him on social media all the net, all the time posting, doing that flow workout that blah blah blah. You know, you know, he's in it now. He's all up in it. Yeah. He's noticing his improvement in performance is way off, off the charts. His recovery is way off the charts. His running mechanics way off the chart. Everything about it, what he's doing is really, really working. But what he did is he gave it a chance. He just gave it a chance. And lo and behold, he's a rock star now. Results so, speak for themselves. I'm just going to leave it at that. So uh, I'm going to put down, I'm going to put down here somewhere. Where am I at? I'm going to put down here somewhere in the video where to find it. Yeah. The website, boom, it's right there. And incidentally, since this is going to end up on YouTube, I would love it if you follow this, subscribe to it, because Leah is going to come out with a lot of really cool stuff in the next podcast. Really cool stuff. Guaranteed. Be ready. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All okay. right. So let's put a fork in it. Put a fork in it. See ya.